Well, it's about quarter to seven. Tuesday, October 18. Seven more days till the new moon. We've returned from a rather extensive trip to the southwest and to the east. Visit family, among other things. On this long, reasonably long set. I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but there is a Jupiter now ascending. It's post-oppositional. And a fainter Saturn should be up there, which you're probably not seeing. One of my checks, of course, is to see if there's any sunlight left on Canyon Mountain. However, the sun is now at least 50 degrees further south than it was in midsummer. So we are rapidly running out of daylight. Got myself a schedule for observing, which you can barely make out before you're there, uh, for the next several days. Want to capture what remains of the summer sky. Now that the sun's drifting south, it's getting rapidly darker earlier, which means the stars practically stand steady overhead at sunset. It's a pretty amazing thing to happen. We'll see Vega all the way up till January 1st, right up to in, in the night sky. It's a rather extraordinary phenomenon. <clears throat> Spent the last couple of days pulling the scope together. Made some adjustments. Right now, I am waiting for sky dark, and as I do so, I am monitoring for the ring nebula which you can vaguely see on the screen right about in that dark band. Meanwhile, I had an excellent alignment um, setting up with Altair and Alpharats as well as, let's see, Alpha, Alpha Ophiuchi. And um, so I've covered both the east and the west. They, tuned up rather nicely. So all I need to do is synchronize on one study to the next and just hop throughout the evening and I should have no difficulty finding what I'm looking for. And there is a clear view of the ring right there. As I said, it's before seven o'clock, sky dark has yet to strike and I am waiting for it. As I mentioned before, aligning the mount turned out to be rather good. Went reasonably well. I actually did have to adjust both the <clears throat> right ascension and the declination mechanically. I used stars both to the east and the west to accomplish it, and I compromised between the various ones before finally setting it up. Here's the active model to the west, which is the direction I'm pointing now. It's got a hour hour index error of 408 and a deck index error of minus 2770. Now if those are arc minutes, uh, that's pretty serious. That's like two-thirds of a degree, but I'm not so sure they're arc minutes. They could be arc se seconds. Now if I switch to the east model, we see we have an HA index error of 1807 with a deck index error of 585, much improved polar axis azimuth 266 and a polar axis elevation of minus 712. So there's still some minor mechanical difficulties. Once again, all of this comes about largely because I have no way of actually seeing Polaris in order to determine where true north is in the, uh, the sidereal sky. So everything has to be compromised out, but I've discovered that things are reasonably accurate as long as I do a synchronization on any part of the sky that I'm happening to be viewing at any given time. So as I go from object study to study, I can use this synchronized function, center the study in the field of view of the display, and I can use the synchronized function to more accurately position the scope for the next study in the sky and at this particular time, we are looking at the Ring Nebula M57 in Lyra. It's my hope in the future that I will be able to upgrade the quality of the real-time imaging so we have a better resolution screen. This is only something nominal 724 
10 or something pixels. Stars are bloated, but this is a great first start. Uh, eventually modifying will require that I do some research to find if I can get some upgraded equipment. One would be the CCD imager itself, and two would be the display screen. Ideally, the display screen would no longer have to be part of the telescope and it would communicate by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi the needed data information for display. That's a future endeavor, but for the time being, there's an awful lot of the night sky to be truly appreciated in getting on camera in this first round of explorations. It should be pretty obvious that it's yet to really be dark enough out to get some good imaging done. What you're seeing here is M27 the dumbbell. It's practically overhead in a very ergonomically poor position for me to have to be imaging off the screen from. But I did want to capture M57 and 27 just for baseline studies. I suspect at some time around 7, let me check the handhold here, it's now 7.06 local time, a parameter which you have to carefully set up in order to be able to get the best go-to accuracy. And I have a clock that reads a satellite in order to do so. Unfortunately, the unit itself is not able to read the information directly from a satellite for whatever reason. Probably just the angle at 45 degrees north. So there we go. Oops, we just had something shoot across the screen. Okay, for the first study of the fall observing season, Messier 75 is a globular cluster of magnitude 8.6, a mere six arc minutes in size, but a whopping 67,500 light years distant. And, uh, I'm trying to remember where this was, but it's definitely culminating right at this time. As I can see, it's minus 20 degrees. So we're pretty reasonably south, and here's the view that we get from the display. Bright, small cluster, condensed core with resolution around it. Given its magnitude, what I believe it was 8.6. We can assume we got stars to magnitude 14.5 being resolved. Very distant cluster. Impressive. Okay. Not too far away, but further north is Messier 72. It's a globular cluster, magnitude 9.2, some six arc minutes in size. A little closer than 75, 55,400 light years distant, obviously on the far side of the Milky Way galaxy. And this is the view you get of a 9.2 globular cluster. Yep. Once again, not as condensed a core, kind of a nebulous region, core region. Uh, various stars, resolvable. Once again, using our normal formula, the brightest star since it's 9.2 would be somewhere around the 15th magnitude visible on the screen. Messier 72. Neighboring 72 is, NG, is M Messier 73. It's an open cluster. And for, I can remember the name of it now. Messier 9. Point, it's a magnitude 9.7, smallish 2.8 arc minutes, 2,500 light years distant. It may or may not be an open cluster. It may just be a small group of scars, as you can see on the screen here. But it certainly was confusable by Charles Messier with his three-inch refractor as being a glowing comet-esque study that just never did anything interesting enough to call it a comet. And there's our view of M72. Okay, 
Okay, what we have here is a planetary nebula in Aquarius, NGC 7009. Very bright, magnitude 8.3, as bright as brighter than the ring, but much smaller, 28 by 23 arc seconds. This baby is 4,300 light years distance and has a central star of magnitude 12.9. Now, I don't expect to see much because we're not magnifying the image very much. But here is our planetary. And there are some issues with the presentation because it seems to have overwhelmed the CCD image at the core of the planetary. So let's see if we can make out that central star at all. Closer. Hard to tell. Brilliant planetary. I think it's called the Saturn planetary, but I'm not quite sure about that. It's been a while since I've familiarized myself with these studies. In fact, it's been over 10 years since I've done any serious observing. But I'm hoping it'll all just seep back into my consciousness with time and without any real effort. Here are the, one of the more spectacular globular clusters. It's in Aquarius, it's Messier 2. Actually, it's saying it's a globular cluster in VER, uh, Vermiculum, I believe. Magnitude 6.5, very large, 11.7 arc minutes, a mere 38,000 light years distant, right up on the celestial equator. The one problem we'll have with it, and you'll see it, is that it's overexposed at the core, which leaves that jagged black region right in the middle of it. So I would have to re-image it at a slower, or faster shuttle speed, or less gain, automatic gain control in the future to get a good image. But isn't that just an extraordinary globular cluster? Messier 2. Another globular on tap, on tap <coughs> excuse me, Messier 30, globular cluster in Capricornus, magnitude 6.9, fairly large, 8.9 arc minutes, some 26,000 light years distant, which puts it probably on our half given its location of the Milky Way galaxy. Minus 23 degrees, however, a good look, very Nice look. Yeah, one of those SpaceX satellites going through there, I think. Anyway, see an awful lot of that sort of thing during imaging. Satellites passing through the field of view. What I'd like to see one do is take a right angle turn. And maybe I'd know it's something more like a UFO. But, and then I'd have, have it captured on the camera. That is a very good look. Messier 30 in Capricornus. Very nice. Okay, another absolutely brilliant globular cluster, Messier 15 in Pegasus, magnitude 6.4, 12.3 arc minutes, 33,600 light years distant. Keep in mind, this is only about half the size of Messier 13, the best globular cluster we can see from the Northern Hemisphere. And yet you get a view like that. Once again, notice the overexposed core region. But look at that spectacular cluster. You never see this, like any cluster look like this through the eyepiece. I continually get amazed by just how astonishing adding an imager is to even a small scope like the six inch Skywalk, Skywatcher in terms of revealing brilliance, resolution, even though the display size is pecuniary right now on this screen. Can you imagine a high definition image of this? That would just be mind-bogglingly beautiful. 
fall into it. Okay, what we have here, NGC 7063. It's not flipping on me right now. So I'm staying with all of the studies that are at least can be found to the east or overhead. 7063 is an open cluster in Cygnus, magnitude 7, 8 arc minutes in size. The brightest stars are about the 12th magnitude, um, 2200 light years distant, pretty well north, 36 degrees. I'm lucky I've been able to pick it out. And here is the view. Camera's at a bit of an odd angle. Spectacular number of stars. They look better on the screen, which I'm having difficulty ang getting a right angle on since we're so close to the zenith. But there are myriads of stars on the screen. Look at that. That's in Cygnus, of course, right along the axis of the Milky Way. Okay, NGC 7027 is a planetary nebula in Cygnus. Notice 42 degrees 19. Um, so I am unable to actually get the scope to reveal more than this, just a few stars, because basically we are now being occulted by the roof of the observatory. It gives me an idea. Probably 40 degree north is about as far as I can get away with in terms of uh, imaging studies to the observatory. So. Well, we're now on to galaxies. A particular one in Pegasus, NGC 7217, magnitude 10.1, fairly large, 4 by 3.4 arc minutes. It's a spiral, 47 million light years distant. It's in a great sky position. It's giving fabulous view. Look at that beautiful ellip spiral galaxy. It almost looks like an elliptical. It's so dense. Wow. Look at the color. It's got a reddish tint to it to my eye. And look at that region of space so populated with stars. For those who have seen previous galactic images, uh, most have been in the 13th, 14th magnitude range. Three, four hundred million light years distant. This one's uh, quite neighborly, but a fabulous view. Gotta love galaxies. More than 90% of the catalog is galaxies. And adding an imager like this is really making it possible to just pick them out. Otherwise, they are very challenging to the eyeballs. Well, if you can think that last galaxy had a great presentation. Check this one out. 7331 in Pegasus. Magnitude 9.5, 10 by 4 arc minutes. It's a class SBC spiral, 46 million light years distant. And if you really take the time to look at the image, you'll see the extension of the spiral arm is going on laterally. And a real sense of spiral. This is a beauty. Core, core region. Nebulosity shooting off left and right. This baby is almost presenting kind of semi-edge on. It actually reminds me a little bit of the Andromeda galaxy seen at twice the distance. Of course, this isn't nearly as large a galaxy as the M M31 is. But I can really see that there's some really nice structure in this galaxy. And if we have a hundred such galaxies to image over the course of a year, and it looks as good as this, I am going to be very pleased with the output from this tour. Oh, it's just extraordinary. Lanes, extensions. What a beauty. And 
thinking we, we might want a carpe noctum out on this NGC Galaxy 7331. I've pushed the shutter to 256 flood, which is maximum, and it gained 44.8. The earlier image was done at 128 flood with a gain of 36. So it might be nice to just sit here for a moment. It's going to take at least 15 seconds be able to create this composite image. And if I'm very careful, you won't, I won't turn the stars comatose. Now I'm seeing, wow, quite a bit of an extension, swirling arms here. It's very subtle, but it's quite apparent. There are glowing dust regions well off to the left side of that core region you're seeing there. Dark lanes. This is amazing. It looks like we're going to get some fabulous views of any galaxies that are 10th magnitude or brighter in the future. Galaxies like M56. Oh, you won't see 81 and 82. They're too far north from the observatory. Look at that spiral structure. Absolutely beautiful. Lotus flowers hanging and spinning in space. Oh, and we could just travel there in our imaginations and through the visual senses. Oh, glorious. Carpe Noct.